Good morning and welcome, especially if you're joining us live on Sunday morning, but you're just as welcome if you're joining us later in the week. We will be doing the usual morning prayer service and at the end of the service, if you want to stay on for a little longer and pray with somebody, the opportunity will be there. But of course, before we actually start, shall we commit the service to God in prayer? Lord, we thank you that even when we can't meet together in our church buildings, whether because of the COVID or because of distance, we can still meet together and above all, we can meet with you. So as we do so, Lord, let us put aside the things which would distract us and concentrate on what you are saying to us through your scriptures and through the preaching of your word and on what we are saying to you as we praise you and we come before you in intercession. We ask this for your glory, Lord. Amen. staying safe. Hi friends. Right, let's play a game, Paul. Two truths and a lie. You can go first, Paul. Okay, I'm married to Mrs. Paul. I have a child called Baby Paul and I live in the Antarctic. Hmm, okay. Which one of those things do you think is a lie? Okay, Paul, what's the answer? 
I don't live in the Antarctic. Yes, that's definitely not true. Firstly, you live here in the stable and secondly, polar bears don't live in Antarctica. They live in the Arctic. Okay, your turn, Hannah. Right, well, two truths and a lie. I have written a book. Last summer, here at the stables, we grew record-breaking cucumbers and I'm pretty handy with a nail gun. I know this one. You can be quite ditzy, Hannah, so I don't think Pete would trust you with his nail gun. What do you think? Well, the thing that wasn't true was that we grew world record breaking cucumbers last year. I mean, uh, some of them here at the stables were quite large, but not record breaking. What? You can use a nail gun? And Pete trusted you with it? Yeah. Believe it or not. So, to be honest, the Bible reading today is a tough one. Sometimes there are bits in the Bible that are just plain tough. But we shouldn't be scared of reading them just because we don't understand them. I mean, the only way we'll get to understand them is if we read them, right? Paul and I have been thinking a bit about the Bible and basically we feel that our reading today tells us that we shouldn't lie. Lying not only hurts God, but other people too. Oops, we lied at the beginning. Sorry, Paul, we told people that we were playing a game. But imagine if we went around saying our lies were truths. You'd have lots of people going on holiday to Antarctica to meet more of your family and people would go around saying, hey, I know someone who grew record-breaking cucumbers. Sometimes it might start with a little lie, but sometimes that can get bigger and bigger and bigger. And end up hurting people and God. Yeah. Okay, let's pray. For Becky, for our Bible reading, and that God would help us not to lie. Good plan, Paul. Dear God, thank you so much for your words. Help us not to be scared of reading, even the tricky bits. Please help Becky as she explains your words to us today. Help her have your words inside of her. Please help us not to lie. Amen. Okay, let's worship Jesus with a song.
we come before God, and particularly during the season of Lent, we are encouraged to think about our own lives. Jesus said to us that the first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. And that the second was to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And I doubt if any of us can look back over the last week and say we did that with complete success. So shall we come before God and confess our failings to him in the words of the general confession? So we say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honour of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brother de thieu ein tad, a gomodoth, a bead agev I hin, true ein hargluith, yes he grist, axin mathai pecodai paups in weir ediverial. Vadai ni anguared o the oath ein hoth bicodai. A rothi ini ras, a neath a rusprid glan. Amen. Our reading this morning is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. 
Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats, so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello everyone, it's great to be with you again today. So this morning we're looking at the beginning of Acts 5. And to be fair, when you get given a passage to preach from, to speak from, sometimes you immediately read the passage and think, great, isn't this exciting? Sometimes you um, think, okay, this, this is quite a well-known passage and what am I going to say about it that's going to perhaps offer perhaps a different insight? And sometimes you see a passage and your heart sinks a little bit. And if I'm honest, this passage is one of those because having heard it read to us, it's, it's, it's kind of out there, isn't it? It's not necessarily what we expect from a passage in the New Testament. And it's quite scary as a preacher to have to preach about believers dropping down dead after something's happened. And actually, it's quite scary to hear that, to be on the receiving end of that, to wonder what this means for us nowadays. But please do bear with me. Please don't um, turn me off or mute me right now, because I'd like to suggest that there's a bit more going under the surface than first meets the eye. But first, shall we pray together before we get stuck in to God's word? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the gift that it is to us. And would you please speak to us by your word and by your spirit through these words that I'm going to say. And Lord, would you help us to understand a bit more of what's going on in this potentially really tricky passage? We ask that you'd help each one of us now through your Holy Spirit. Amen. So there is a lot going on. Let's have a little look and have, let's have a recap of where we are up to this point. So there's a couple of key passages earlier on in Acts um, that I'm just going to remind us of. And they say a lot about the lifestyle of the collective group of believers at the beginning of, beginning of Acts. So the first one is Acts 2 verses 42 to 47. And we learn a lot about how the believers were um, operating. We learn a lot about how they were living their lives. And the key point of this that I'm going to draw out is this phrase, this sentence. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So we've heard a bit about this in recent weeks, about how they lived. And it, it was living um, a different type of lifestyle to the other people who were in the culture around them. And then Acts 4, verses 32 to 36, the passage that Kai was, um, the, the part of the passage that Kai was speaking on last week. And just to draw out from this, that it says all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And then in that passage, we see that there were no needy persons among them. Then we hear that from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought them money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. And then just at the end of that passage, we hear about this man called Joseph, Joseph Barnabas. And Barnabas um, means the son of encouragement. And his name isn't a mistake. There's a reason that he was called that. Um, and he sold a field that he owned and he brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And so that was an example of how things were happening in the early church. And that's what's happened directly before we get to chapter five. 
So we've had this amazing example of what Joseph Barnabas has done. He sold a field that would have been a substantial amount of money and brought all that money and laid it at the disciples, at the apostles' feet. And that's quite a context that we've got for how the early Christian church was living. And it is an exemplar of how sort of the ideal of how they would be living and the part of and the part of community played in their life it was that group of believers together and it was what they would be aiming for for their behavior to reflect that there was a community where they were living together that they needed each other they supported each other um, and from time to time things were sold fields houses not all the time. It's not something that was happening every day um, and not everything, because if everything was sold, then they were all going to end up being quite needy in a fairly short space of time. But instead, that they didn't have things that they kept for themselves and they didn't um, have needy people amongst them. And that's quite a claim. So just a little bit more backstory to add to that. And so this group of believers that we're talking about were living as a family grouping. So it's something um, that used to be called uh, a king group. So a living in a family grouping and those family groupings may well look different to what we see as a family that live in a house together nowadays. But they were forming this um, family grouping not based on blood ties, but based on shared belief, on a shared vision and a shared way of lifestyle. And that was founded on loyalty and trust, on truth telling and having open homes for the group, that they had an obligation to each other. And we see the way that that works out when they were supporting each other, when they weren't having needy people amongst them and that people would have been share, um, selling things and sharing those pre proceeds. And so the first Jewish Christians were living in such a way. The other thing that's important to note is that there were patrons in that culture, the same as you might get patrons of a football club now, that in those days there'd be patrons which... Um, in some ways operated a little bit with the hierarchy of society. You had people who were wealthy and people, and these people could sometimes be patrons to people who had less and they, they worked together and formed um, a bond of patron and client. So Joseph Barnabas has sold his field at the end of chapter four. And in chapter five, we are introduced to Ananias and Sapphira. And they also sold property. They discussed it between them. They were husband and wife. And they um, sold this property. They brought money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And then something pretty impressive happens because Peter, using knowledge that he, he's gained from a supernatural way, nothing freaky but through God, it's, not, it's beyond the natural resources that he had. He knew that it wasn't quite the full story. He knew that it wasn't everything that Ananias had got for the property. And he's really clear to um, remind Ananias that that property was his. It was at his disposal. And the money, even after it had been sold, was his. And it was up to him how he used it too. But because of how he operated, because of how he behaved, by bringing that money and laying it at Peter's feet in that way, it was implied that that was all of it. And so Peter's saying to Ananias that he's not only lying to the human apostles, but he is lying to God. And that's a big, big deal. And Ananias's reaction to that being outed, being found out, being um, pulled up in this way, is he fell down and died. And so just to be clear, this is not, this is not God striking him down. This is his human reaction. And we don't know exactly what caused that. Perhaps it was shock. Perhaps it was a heart attack. We, we're not going to stand here and debate that now. But he fell down and died. And as a response to that, the community were fearful. 
not really surprising. It's, it's a massive thing to happen and it's a really freaky thing to happen. So in comes Safira and she doesn't know that her husband has died. It's happened a couple of hours previously. And Peter gives her an opportunity to tell the truth, to find out what's going on. And he asks her this question. Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? And she says, yes. Peter knows in his being, he's got that revelation from God of what is going to happen next. Her reaction, very similar to that of her husband, to being um, called out in this way, is she fell down at Peter's feet and died. Great fear sees the church. Not surprisingly. This is terrifying. Two of the believers, two of the group who had been living as that family grouping, had done something quite shocking because they'd gone against the way that that community was operating. And then they've dropped down dead. So a couple of things that are really key in this that Ananias and Sapphira had discussed it between themselves. This was a decision that they had made that they were going to sell and that they were going to take part of this money and lay it at the apostles' feet. But they were going to do so in such a way that made it look like they were giving everything. They had been at liberty to sell or not to sell. They'd been at liberty to keep the money or not to keep the money. But what they weren't at liberty to do was to try and deceive the apostles. To lie to God is what they've been outed as doing. Because by their wealth and what they were doing, they qualified as patrons of that community of believers. And that made them pretty important. Not that there was a hierarchy, but they'd, pe they'd probably naturally be people that were looked up to. But at the heart of that community of believers was honesty and integrity. So Ananias and Sapphira were seeking the honour of patron, but they were lying. They were trying to get that honour as patron, but not in an honest way. They were secretly hoarding some of the wealth. And yet how they'd, how they'd given it to Peter was in a way that implied that they were submitting to his authority but their behavior actually showed that they weren't their behavior showed them to be outsiders of that community that was so important and that they brought shame and dishonor because they violated the christian community in the way it was behaving in the way it was belonging together and probably one of the reasons why we see this contrast between how Joseph Barnabas acted and how Ananias and Sapphira acted is because it was a really early days for this community. And so it was a really key time for them to be known uh, by how they needed to be known. Um, they needed to be shown that they were different from the communities that they um, lived alongside in that culture that they were different. So their standards that they had agreed to and people had um, agreed to live in this way, it was a good way to live. It's not that people had been forced to live in this way. They could, they could choose it, but they needed to do that wholeheartedly and to do it honestly and with integrity. It's a tough passage to get our heads round. It's a tough passage to see how perhaps that shock of revelation, the shock of their behaviour being um, shown to not be in line with how they should have been living. So much of a shock that somehow that couple ended up falling down dead. And when we read it now, it's still quite a shock. It's still not necessarily how we expect a passage in the Acts of the Apostles to read. And so that can take a bit of getting our heads around too. But let's be realistic. We all do things that are not in line with how our loving Heavenly Father would like us to live. 
we perhaps do things that are not in line with what a church community might might aspire to. We're all human beings. And perhaps there's something to be said for for how we present that. Because it's easier sometimes to to keep those things tucked away or have one of one way of um behaving in a certain situation and perhaps another way at church. We're now going to have a time of sung worship and perhaps we can bring those things, things that might be on our hearts, to our Father God as we worship together. And then we'll see what this passage perhaps means for us today. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus regrets and mistakes Come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ.
can we take from this passage today? I think one of the key things we can take is that the basics, the things we take for granted perhaps, are really important. So truth-telling, the importance of that. It does appear almost obvious that you just assume that we would, as believers, tell the truth. God's word commands us to. And yet here was a group of seemingly really committed believers. And Sapphira's um, immediate answer when Peter asked her that question was to lie. If she hadn't have lied, I'm guessing that the story would have had a different conclusion. Peter was giving her that opportunity to say the right thing and do the right thing. Even at that point, although she didn't know that her husband had died, she didn't know that he had been found out. But it had, she had been given that opportunity to reflect and perhaps think, oh, hang on a second. Perhaps it wasn't a good idea to lie about this. We need to get our basics right. And the importance of church communities, of what they look like. Church communities are never going to be perfect places because they're full of human beings and we mess them up. But we can still aspire to be the best we can be. And with that first community of believers, they had really high aspirations. They were aiming to ensure that there was nobody needy amongst them. They were living as this big family. That can't have been easy. And yet I imagine it brought such amazing joy. But it probably brought its struggles too. So they didn't give up even though it wasn't the simplest thing to do. And the way in which that those church communities can witness to those around us. The witness to the culture that we live in, that on the whole is going to look quite different to how a church community behaves. And also to have a spirit-filled church community. Peter could only do what he did in this passage because he had been equipped with gifts of the Holy Spirit. He was given revelation direct from God about what Ananias and Sapphira had been doing. He was given revelation of how that situation was going to pan out. And if he hadn't had that dependence on the Holy Spirit, if he hadn't got that closeness to God, to know that what he was uttering from his mouth was was true, it was from God, then again, this narrative would have been very different. And there's lots to be learnt and there's lots to be taught. There's lots to be practised with gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not suggesting we should really, at this point in time, follow um, the example of Peter. Because I think it's probably safer to, to veer, at least if you're starting out in gifts of the Spirit, towards more encouragement um, rather than predicting somebody about to drop down dead. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go near that. But God does work um, in mysterious ways. I know it sounds trite. Um, but also God uses people in particular ways at particular times. But it was a, um, it showed how much that those first believers, how the early church, how the apostles were spirit filled and working with a dependence on God. Lastly, I think it shows how important it is to grapple with those tricky parts of scripture. Sometimes we might think that they fall mostly in the Old Testament, and we, we probably do see a bit more of the, um, the gruesome, the battles, the um, people dropping down dead, things that we can perhaps sometimes say, well, that's the Old Testament, it's important, it's really key. But things have changed somewhat because um, Jesus has come. And yet, when we have a passage like this, Jesus has come, and it's still quite difficult. 
But there is such an importance in grappling with that. We can chew over God's word because if it's here, it is important. And we can seek the Holy Spirit to help us. We can't put God in a box. We can't put his word in a box. We can't assign everything that we think is a little bit um, edgy, perhaps, to the Old Testament. But rather, we can work through it. And by working through it, even though that might not be comfortable for me or it might not be comfortable for you, we do grow as a consequence. So let's pray as we finish. Heavenly Father, thank you for all of your word, even the parts that we might find difficult at times. Would you help us even now to really digest the parts that we need to take on board, particularly for our situation today? Lord, would you help us to be a community of believers who are characterised by the indwelling of your Holy Spirit? By char- that we would be characterised with integrity and truth-telling. And Lord, we ask that we would be a good witness to people who don't yet know about you. And that you would help us, through your Holy Spirit, to share your good news. Amen. Let us set our hearts and minds on our Lord as we come before him in prayer. We give him thanks for his goodness and his faithfulness. We remind ourselves of his power and authority and his call on us to pray for the world he made and the people he loves. Heavenly Father, we pray for countries devastated by war. We pray that you would raise up people who are committed to peacemaking, that you would soften hearts and enable enable ceasefire negotiations to be successful. We pray healing and restoration for all who have been injured or have suffered trauma. We pray for the provision of a safe home for refugees or people living in ruined cities with access to clean water, food and medical care, especially during the pandemic. We pray that your light and hope would transform places where there is hopelessness and despair. We pray for our national and local leaders. We pray that you would give them wisdom and surround them with excellent advisors who will help guide and inform their decision making. We pray that you'd help them to communicate clearly and lead with honesty and integrity. We pray that you give them courage and humility. We ask for strength, good health and peace for them and their families. As schools reopen, we pray that they are able to create a calm environment, that students feel safe and able to focus on their studies, that they can learn and grow, have fun and spend time with friends. We pray for children and young people who are fearful, anxious or confused by the uncertainty and change. We pray for your peace to surround them. For teachers, we pray for inspiration in their preparation and patience and wisdom and energy as they teach. We pray for protection and good health for all. We pray for children learning at home that you would sustain them, give them energy and perseverance. And we pray that they would have all the resources necessary. We pray for our Christian community in Aberystwyth and beyond. We pray that as we join together in worship today, even though we're not physically together, we would be one in heart and mind, sharing the same love and the same spirit. We pray that you would continue to build us up to be a community that loves you and looks to make you known to those around us. In your name. Amen. We join together to pray the Lord's Prayer. Christ 
cross brings transformation Then I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just the doorway into resurrection life And if I join you in your suffering Then I'll join you when you rise When you return in glory With all the angels and the saints My heart will still be Thank you for being with us this morning. And also, of course, our thanks to those who've contributed to the service. But it may be that something in the service has spoken to you and you want prayer about it, or that there is something else in your life that you want prayer about. If that is the case, email the link that will appear on the screen and somebody from our prayer team will get in touch with you and arrange the prayer. And now before we actually go our separate ways, a prayer. Lord, we thank you for being with us this morning, for what you have taught us today, and for the opportunities that you have given us to worship you. Help us through this coming week to remember what we have learned, and to continue to praise you, whatever our circumstances. And Lord, keep us faithful to you in all that we do. Amen. And we'll conclude with the words of the grace, which I will say in Welsh. Grass ein har glwydd, yes, a grist, a chariot du, a cam daithus er a spread glan, for thou God a neoth beeth beethoith. Amen. Hello, friends, and I hope you're doing well today, wherever you are. Now, I've got a question for you, and it is especially pertinent if you are watching live with us on Sunday. And the question is this What day is it tomorrow? Answer. It is, of course, St. David's Day. Woohoo! Now, I don't know if you can remember, but this time last year in St. Mike's Church, we had a special evening of prayer for the nation of Wales. And as part of that prayer on St. David's Day, we prayed that the Lord would move in the land of Wales, he would move in new ways, and we would be flexible to the new ways in which he would move. Just a few weeks later, the whole world felt like it got turned upside down as COVID struck. Church buildings were closed, schools were closed, life changed, what felt like at the time forever. And many of us were questioning what on earth is going on. But in the midst of all of that, God was at work and absolutely doing a new thing. Did you know that in the month of March last year, the word pray was Googled more than ever before? And did you know that in this last year, attendance at churches, be it online or in person by adults, has quadrupled? God is certainly on the move and God is certainly doing a new thing. Now, God didn't cause COVID to happen and God is mortified and feels the pain that we feel as all the results of COVID and his heart breaks as our heart breaks for all the pain that we see. But in the midst of all that darkness, his glory has been shining forth 
and more and more people have come to know him as he has answered our prayer. The moral of it all is prayer absolutely works and praying for the nation works. God is hearing us when we call. And so tomorrow evening on St David's Day, we're gonna have a time of prayer for the nation as well. On Zoom for just 20 minutes or so, a short time of prayer as we lift this nation of Wales to the Lord and pray that he would continue to move. All are welcome to join us. It doesn't matter if you live in Aberystwyth or further afield. If you've got a heart for seeing God to move, we would love to see you there. And we would love to see as many people come as possible as together we pray for the land. You can sign up on Church Suite. You can sign up through our social media. You can see all the details on our website for how to get the codes. And you can email us at office at St. Mike's on Net and we will send the codes out to you as well. God is on the move, people. Let's keep praying and let's keep being blessed by the good things that he wants to do here in Wales and across the world. Take care and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.